It's uh, my pleasure to have Yukon Huang with us this evening. He is a uh, scholar of note who understands economics quite well. As you heard, he has a distinguished career at the World Bank and is currently with the Carnegie uh, uh, Organization and um, at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. And uh, last year, he wrote a book called, is it The China Conundrum? Is that the title? Cracking the China Conundrum. Uh, because we do have so many questions about this uh, nation, this uh, 1.4 billion, depending on who's counting, uh, size nation with these economic uh, trends that are of note. And um, interestingly, when Dr. Huang wrote his book, which came out last year, uh, after, at, right at the end of the uh, 2016 election, uh, he made the prediction that given the trends both in China and in the United States and with the leadership that seemed to be arising, the politics of it, that China and the United States inevitably would enter into a trade war. It seems you were right. So could you perhaps start this evening and again, welcome uh, and, and explain what led you to believe that we were going to enter into this now very real yeah. trade war? Well, you begin with this vision of what China and America are all about. And the idea is that they're quite different as countries. But we now have a situation where the leadership is quite similar. So President Xi Jinping and President Trump have a lot of similarities. Uh, you have the... Uh, America first, from, from our side. Uh, from China, the China dream. President Trump was elected with a very strong populist agenda. Xi Jinping has a very strong nationalist agenda. They both have a vision of where they want the country to go. They both want a more assertive policies. And therefore, it's given where China's coming from and where America, where we are at, and part of the book is saying that a increase in economic intentions is more or less inevitable. Right, well, uh, and so in fact that inevitability has come to pass. We've seen the, the imposition of uh, quite uh, significant uh, tariffs from the side of the United States. Uh, of course, the president argues that these are mirroring and that there is a search for reciprocity. But uh, as we sit here tonight, there is a truce in this particular trade war that you predicted would be coming. Uh, what can we look for? And, and maybe uh, you can analyze a bit the, uh, the trade war itself and its justification, perhaps. Well, it's interesting because uh, the outcome of this recent agreement uh, led to a surge in the markets. So let's go back and ask what was really agreed upon. And what was agreed upon was a ceasefire. <laughs> that is, there would be no more hostile acts toward each other. There was no full agreement on the problem, just an agreement that in 90 days the problem will be discussed. So the first interesting point is, why are markets so positive about a problem which not yet been solved? The framework has not been detailed. Okay, all you've done is shoved it out 90 more days. So what the markets are telling us is they don't like trade wars. Everyone loses in a trade war. Consumers lose, producers lose. Markets hate the uncertainty of a trade war. So I guess the first point I would make is the markets are telling us that a trade war is counterproductive. And they're hoping that it'll just go away. But of course the issue is will it go away. I guess the other point I would basically say is People are asking then, what should be done? Is this trade war necessary? And I would say, it's not necessary. There are real issues between America and China, but a trade war does not address them. And then we talked about the inevitability a bit earlier. Yes. So you have a counterproductive trade war, a necessary trade war, but ironically, an inevitable trade war. And the key issue then is, how does the US and China sort this out in the future? Well, uh, if you ask the president, he believes, the president of the United States, that is, he believes that this is something that is winnable and that, in fact, uh, the pressure, starting with a maximal uh, approach to negotiations, uh, is something that will inevitably force uh, the Chinese side and President Xi Jinping into concessions 
that are favorable, or at least from the President of the United States' perspective, uh, mirroring of the types of trade policies that have been pursued in, in, in a, an American perspective uh, have been exploiting uh, of a world trade um, uh, reality that has uh, favored, ultimately, the Chinese. Hmm. Well, the question of whether a trade war is a good tactic that America can use to win uh, if you think about it, history has shown us that no trade war turns out to be successful from either side. Everyone loses. Why is it that everyone loses? Well, think about this. When you levy $200 billion of tariffs on Chinese products coming in, what are you essentially doing? You're essentially asking American consumers and American companies to pay more. Yes. Okay. So how can Americans think they're winning? <laughs> because consumers have to pay more. Businesses have to pay more. Okay. Then on China's side, of course... Prices are higher, so Chinese producers lose. You don't see any winners out of this process. Now, some people would say, well, what about the iron and steel or aluminum companies where the tariffs have gone up? And this, there are a few companies who actually their profits have surged, but those are relatively very small percentage of the producers. But aluminum, steel, and iron ore, they're used by everybody. So the U.S. automobile makers are actually starting to suffer. People who use these products start to suffer. They far outnumber those who benefit. In essence, a trade war doesn't win. But the question is, does this put pressure? Does this put pressure on China to negotiate? And I think the answer is probably it won't succeed. That pressure uh, is not a big issue from a China perspective. Uh, Ten years ago, trade was 70% of China's economy. It was what I call more trade dependent. Today, it's below 40%. It's relatively independent anymore. Trade doesn't generate growth in China. People have this mistaken view that because they're such a big exporting nation and they trade a lot, that that's the reason why they grew so rapidly. In fact, trade is generating negative growth for China for the last several years. It's not a trade promoter. Growth coming from consumption investment, not from trade. So a trade war just generates losses, but it doesn't really actually damage China in some fundamental sense. I mean, the best example is the iPhone. And this is the symbol of the trade war. Uh, the iPhone is made in China. All of Apple's products are made in China. Why aren't they making it here? And what I want is for Apple to produce the phones here. So that $800 iPhone that everyone has, that should be produced in America, and Americans will benefit, workers will benefit. The problem is that of that $800 iPhone, only $25 of that goes to Chinese in terms of the assembly. $350 goes to South Korea, Japan, Taiwan for the components. $400 goes to Apple. Incredible profit margin. That benefits Americans. So here, if you want to slap a, a tariff on these iPhones made in China, you don't really hurt the Chinese. And one of the great ironies of a trade war is that 60% of, of China's exports to America are actually managed and controlled by American companies. Okay, so that's a great, great irony here, actually. You end up actually hitting American companies. You think about this issue about tariffs on cars. Take a look at General Motors, for example. That's the predominant American manufacturer. How many people realize that General Motors sells more cars in China than it sells in America? Okay? So we have a fundamental problem. Take Intel. High tech, major producer of semiconductors, critical technology. Here's the problem. 80% of Intel's products are bought by China. <laughs> Suppose you told Intel, I don't want you to be selling your high tech goods to China anymore. Who's Intel going to sell this to? <laughs> and this is what I call the big issue. You think this trade war can put pressure on key industries, but very un unpredictable who is actually affected. In the end, many American concerns are actually more affected. I mean, that iPhone is made by Chinese workers in China. They're paid $2 an hour, okay? Suppose you brought it back here and decided you'd have to basically pay workers $25 an hour. Even then, how many people want to slave away in a, in a, in a, in a, a factory assembling iPhones? Very few. So I think part of this issue in the trade war is the irony is it's really not about trade. 
This is the great irony. The headline is always, U.S. tied trade war, tariffs. Everyone says, well, this is supposed to be about trade. And the answer is, it isn't about trade, actually, because trade isn't actually the problem. Americans benefit a lot from imports of relatively inexpensive consumer goods from China, and that's uh, uh, improved the living standards here. It's also allowed people to save more and spend. But the tremendous advantage that China has is not in manufactured goods, it's in services and agricultural commodities. So when you look about what China offered to America, to Trump in Argentina, basically saying, I'm going to buy more natural gas, or I'm going to buy more soybeans. I can't buy more high-tech goods because you won't sell them to me. <laughs> okay. So this is all f uh, fascinating, right? And, and you know, the, uh, there are others who would argue that some of this history is, of course, um, one that has been uh, lopsided. Because if we talk about trade, for example, when you talked about some of these goods, well, the argument would then be, well, during this era when China was, in fact, relying on its exports and on its trade, there was a fair amount of dumping going on with the, for instance, steel and aluminum. Uh, when they were uh, developing these goods that were being exported, whether they were in the technology realm or elsewhere, not only were they manufacturing at a very low cost, labor cost, which was beneficial, clearly, to everyone in this room and to American consumers overall, but in the process, there was a fair amount of IP theft in that if you wanted a foreign technology company or anyone who had intellectual property of any sort to be able to participate in uh, the economy in China, whether it's market access or even just being able to manufacture, well, you had to partner with a Chinese company in order to be able to operate within the structure of the Chinese state. And um, so when you look at it from and take these arguments, right. then there is the f there is the argument of fairness, and which is one Correct. that the president of the United States is currently raising on a regular basis and quite loudly and perhaps even uh, in ways that that have uh, overtones of threat mm -hmm. to them. But um, but you can see how. In fact, there, are, there is an argument to be made that, in fact, there was this long arc of mm -hmm. non-reciprocity, unfairness, mm -hmm. that has allowed for now China, of course, to become a service exporter and for the United States, as you've just described it, to be a provider of commodities rather than of those products that are high value. So how do you then try to balance this? Because it seems to be that the argument that's being made today is we're just trying to right the ship. I think your description of the issue of unfairness is correct. There is a general perception in America that China's economic policies are unfair, and this needs to be addressed. And I think there are aspects of China's policies which are unfair and need to be dealt with, but they're not trade policies, mm -hmm. actually. Let's go back to the perception. One perception is that trade is unfair because China's wages are so low. How can America compete with China's workforce when they're paid so little? But here's the interesting thing. Wages today in China are seven times as high as they were 10 years ago. Okay? So maybe they had low wages 10 or 15 years ago, but today they're not so low anymore. They're lower than, they're higher than the Philippines and Thailand and Malaysia. No one complains. So how can it be that wages go up 700%, but China's still, in terms of trade, competitive? And the answer, of course, it's productivity's gone up a lot. And why? Infrastructure. And of course, this is a major debate here in America. Sure. How much should we spend on infrastructure? Well, China spent an enormous amount. How much is enormous? They invest 45% of their income, and a large chunk of that is in infrastructure. 45% investment rate. Here in America, we invest 17% right. of our economy and hardly anything in infrastructure. So the solution, the problem really, the trade, the advantages didn't come from what I call low wages. It came from productivity increase. But let's go back to the common perception. The common perception is that America has a huge trade deficit and that China was responsible. Mm -hmm. And then very few people are economists, so I always have a tough time trying to explain to them, is this true or not true? So yeah. I go back and look at history. When did America's trade deficit become a huge issue? And the answer is around 1999, year 2000. America's trade deficit became enormous and it stayed enormous for three or four or five years. 
And the 9-11 uh, helped boost that up because the government security military experiences went up a lot. Yes. So America's trade problems surfaced between 1999 and 2003 and 4. Then let's look at China back then. China did not have a trade surplus. It did not have a significant trade surplus at all. How could it be causing America's trade deficit when China doesn't even generate a surplus? Mm -hmm. Now, actually, today, the interesting issue here is America's trade deficit is getting larger. It's getting much larger because the U.S. budget is deficit is getting much larger. Mm -hmm. What about China? China's trade deficit has disappeared. It's likely to run a current account deficit next year. So how can China be causing America's trade problems today when China is not even generating a trade surplus? <laughs> okay? But here's a, here's a funny issue, though. China may not be generating an overall trade surplus, but it has a huge surplus with America. And the answer to that, of course, is it must have a huge deficit with somebody else that offsets this. And the answer, it does. The commodity producers, East Asia, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, huge deficits, but then a surplus with the West because the West buys the consumer goods, China gets the raw materials, the parts from other countries. China's in balance, but the West is in a deficit. But here's the interesting issue. Why is it? that Europe doesn't have a huge trade deficit, but America does. At a global financial crisis, both countries had similar trade deficits, but Europe no longer. But America has a significant one. And that reason is very simple. Europe basically solved its budget problem. It brought its budgets into balance because of the global financial crisis, whereas here in America, we have not done that. So we continue to have a trade deficit problem. Europe no longer does. Europe's generating huge surpluses. But think about this. This really has nothing to do with China. It really has to do with the country's own policies. So that's why I say this issue of a U.S.-China trade war is not about trade. We can solve the trade problem here in America very simply. We just bring our budget, government budget into balance. We, don't, we won't have a deficit. But the unfairness issue is out there. Yeah. And that's not a trade issue. It's a question of unfair investment practices, right. restrictions on companies coming into America to operate. And they feel like they don't have full liberty to produce what they want and establish companies in a way they would like to. And I think that is a legitimate complaint. And it's particularly strong in services. What is America's strength? America's strength is services, financial services, entertainment services, media services, medical services, engineering services, insurances, everything. This is where China is very restrictive. American firms are handicapped. But think about this. This has nothing to do with manufacturing. It's nothing to do with industrial jobs. It's not about aluminum or autos. It's about services. This is where China really should liberalize. It is unfair to restrict American investment. But I would also add a, a kind of a footnote. Suppose China liberalized. Okay. I'm, Open it I'm up. I'm going to try and okay. imagine that particular okay. scenario. All right. So all this foreign money from America starts to go into China. Investing because it now has access to market. What's going to happen to America's trade deficit? It's going to get worse. <laughs> because all these American companies are going to go to China, invest, and produce something. <laughs> and they'll start to export it back to America. So the great irony is, if Trump gets his way, if we solve this unfairness issue, the thing that drove this whole problem of trade deficit actually gets worse. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think this is the great irony that people, one of the reasons why this problem hasn't been solved, because people realize one is not about trade, second is about services and foreign investment. But if you solve that, what do you do about the trade issue? It becomes a little bit worse. Well, it's, it's fascinating because really if those markets were to open up, then, then of course the expectation is that there would be other types of benefits and that investment would then be also generated in a way that would perhaps offset some of these rising deficits. Isn't that right? Well, I think that, that way it would help if you asked or encouraged more Chinese foreign investment to come to America. Because when it comes to America, it creates jobs here, right? But just think what we're trying to do. We're actually trying to tighten... Chinese foreign investment coming in. Yes, through okay. things like CFIUS, CFIUS. and others. And, there's and, some and for those of you who don't know what CFIUS is, maybe you can explain. Well, CFIUS is an intergovernment panel which scrutinizes foreign investment to see whether there are some security concerns. And I think this is entirely legitimate. There are areas, 
activities where you would want to make sure that the foreign investment does not get into security issues which should be detrimental to Americans' interests. But there's lots of other areas. Well, when China was trying to buy Smithfield ham, people said that's a security issue, okay? For All those right? bacon lovers. For the bacon yes. lovers. There. <laughs> but he, here's the point here is one of the things that's occurring today is that America's tightening up the restrictions on Chinese investment coming here. So we're tightening up their money coming here. We're asking them to loosen it for us to go there. On balance, therefore, more money is going to go out than come in. And I, I don't think that's in actually America's interest fully. What you want actually is, is, I would call, a level playing field for both sides. And I think that is a goal that, that both sides should work toward, and there are ways to achieve this. But right now, tariffs, tariffs is sort of like the worst means of trying to address this concern. Yeah, and, 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 and you make a very good point that, in fact, and I think you've made, a, uh, made it clear to everyone here, that it's not about trade. In fact, that it is this unfairness of investment practices and policies. And so uh, getting to that level playing field it has been difficult. In fact, it seems that the opposite has been happening through policies, uh, the centralized policies of the Chinese government and of Xi Jinping, wanting to dominate certain industries, making sure that his China dream and the China 2025, which is achieving dominance in certain specific fields, including artificial intelligence and other areas of, of, global, uh, of global importance, uh, will not bring us to this level playing field. So the argument, of course, at least with this current administration, is that you have to use what tools you do have, Correct. which are the trade tools. So it may be the imperfect tool for a problem that it's not actually seeking to solve, but rather trying to solve a different problem through using this as a, as a means to, to get there. I think you raise a very good point. Uh, can you justify this tariffs and the trade war as a tactical means? because we cannot find alternative means that could address this issue. And I think that it begins by trying to figure out what the issue is. Yeah. And then figuring out whether we have an instrument to address it. And then you mentioned a very good point, that there is concern about this China made in China 2025, which was implemented or instituted in 2015. In some ways, it's kind of an ironic statement, because people would say, I thought everything was already made in China. How can <laughs> you make any more in China? Well, what the Chinese want to do is to make more high-tech products. So they identify strategic sectors and industries, and it says they'd like to produce more. And this report is cited something like 80 times in America's uh, study outlining the basis for the trade war. Basically, we do not like this. It is, it is likely to uh, lower America's competitive innovative advantages. Uh, it's an issue of a rising power challenging the technological supremacy of the dominant power, and this is a big issue. This is part of what I call the inevitability. Mm -hmm. And then the issue becomes, well, everybody, every country has the right to be, or want to be more innovative and technologically advanced. Poor countries and rich countries, everyone does. The question is that China's not doing it fairly. And this, I think, is a legit, legitimate concern. And the general concern is that China subsidizes its industries. And this is unfair. And so what I talk about is the issue would be, do we in America subsidize our industries or not? $100 billion a year are spent by local governments in America to attract investments to their areas. So Amazon was shopping around for a second headquarters. Washington, Virginia, where I live in Washington, you have to offer tax benefits, free land, everything else to get them to come. Football team wants to move. Everyone offers a free stadium and everything else. So we spent $100 billion dollars localities. Yeah, let's stop doing that. Huh? <laughs> Some people say this is unfair. I, yeah. As an economist, I don't think it's a good thing, actually. I don't think localities should be competing with each mm -hmm. other, but we do. Toyota moves to a factory in Tennessee. They provide all sorts of subsidies, okay? Mm -hmm. But we also do this through the federal government tax system and programs. We subsidize new industries. Those in the audience, for example, who buy electric cars, install solar panels in their houses, geothermal heating systems, you get a huge tax write-off to encourage you to buy these products. Then companies get a huge depreciation allowance to produce them. So that's how we subsidize, and we subsidize over the place. Now, here's the problem. When you go to the Chinese and say, 
you are not doing or you're supporting unfairly your industries. You should be doing what we do. And here's what we do. We do it through the tax system, largely through deductions and local governments providing funding. And China will accept, sorry, our people don't pay taxes, okay? Our households don't file returns, okay? We don't have deductions. Our companies don't have depreciation schedules which are clear and confident. How can we subsidize our industries? Our system is, remember, we're a developing country. We have a per capita GDP of 9,000. Your per capita GDP is 60,000. Your people are, in, are very familiar with tax systems and incentives. We don't. So we subsidize through land transfers, and we subsidize through credit flows through the banking system. And we in America would not do this. First of all, our banks are all private. Their banks are largely state. So you have a fundamental problem. It's not the principle of subsidies, which is actually wrong or unfair. It's that we have different ways of doing it. And then when you think about it, your question is, how do you solve it? I don't know how you solve it. <laughs> I was looking for an <laughs> answer. <laughs> okay. You can't solve this. You could, you could only solve it by saying both sides should stop subsidizing. Yeah. Okay? Okay, I'm good with that. Okay. <laughs> and I think I could be good with that. But a practical matter, you have to start at home also. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you really, you, you raise this issue of the, per, of the type of structures that are, are true of, of both sides as well, right? Which is, on the one hand, you have state-owned banks and mm. state-owned enterprises. And on the other, you have shareholder-owned uh, uh, industry for mm. the most part, right? And, and so uh, that raises the question, of course, that, are more, that, are, that is more strategic, which is, do you have industries that are necessarily aligned with the state agenda and a, and a state uh, strategic uh, geopolitical interest, or do you have industries that are actually seeking a profit uh, have a profit motive at its at its core and returning shareholder value as the driving motivation towards uh, it, which can often go counter to uh, national strategic interests. So I think that that it sometimes feels like we're comparing apples to oranges in that when you when you are dealing with a state owned enterprise, uh, whether it's a question of subsidy or not the alignment of those institutions with the state is so perfect, or if it's not, will be made to be perfect, uh, versus one which is wholly independent and, and is trying to take advantage of whatever subsidies may exist, but not necessarily uh, returning to the state uh, its, its uh, strategic interests. Right. Well, I think you, you've nailed a, uh, another issue which I think is difficult to resolve. The dominance of the state is ownership and running of enterprises and activities in China. And you compare that with us here in America where we basically say the market should dictate and operate it. And that changes uh, the way this economy is run. It changes accountability. It even has what I would call a, a major influence on whether or not democracies or particular systems evolve or don't evolve. Mm -hmm. I, said, I think this is a big issue. Here's what you get from a Chinese perspective, however, and uh, in my book, I write about this. Actually, China and America have a similar kind of a problem. Uh, our companies in America are too big to fail, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And whether it's in the internet business, or in the banking system, or the companies, uh, companies are fading out and disappearing and being bought out. And we have a problem here in America because, as it was with the car sector, we can't let them fail. We have to figure out how to regulate them and promote them. China has a slightly different problem. Its state enterprises are so big, they're too big to manage. <laughs> okay? They become uncontrollable. They go overseas and do various things, and the government doesn't even know what they're doing anymore. So I think both countries have a problem in terms of size, but the nature of ownership changes it. So we still have a problem in America in saying, what happens if the financial banking sector gets such that there's only one or two banks in the whole country? And we're getting there. What happens if a Facebook or a Google or other dominates the whole sector? Yeah. Okay? Or Amazon takes over all our distribution activities? Okay? I don't know the answer to that, but here's what China says. I see that America is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger and getting more concentrated. Yeah. Okay? And I'm trying to catch up. So I'm going to try to support getting big. And of course, that means preserving the state entity's ownership. 
Yeah. So here's the huge challenge for China. Can I do this? Does it make sense? So I become inefficient? And the problem, of course, is these state companies in China, they're too big to manage, and they're starting to lose too much money. So it is an issue. It is a conflict between America and U.S., the solution, again, is not so obvious. <laughs> right, and we hope that that conflict does not then, you know, enter into this uh, expectation by some that a Thucydides trap would then lead us not so much into a trade war, but rather into a shooting war that would, in fact, be uh, military rather than uh, financial. Um, you know, you, you raised a, an important question uh, as, you, as you talked about this, because you said, well, what do you do when there's consolidation in the marketplace? And as we're seeing, and as you raised with these very large organizations like Facebook, which are much larger than you have a GDP or have a financial statement that's much larger than the GDP of many nations. Um, and the answer, of course, has been that traditionally in the United States, after you go through a fair amount of pain and suffering with these organizations mm -hmm. consolidating, you have regulation and you have antitrust actions, and we haven't yet achieved that, but it sounds at least currently that uh, those noises are being made in Washington, mm -hmm. that that mm -hmm. recognition is occurring, but that, for example, should China have similar problems, which is large, unmanageable institutions and structures, Will there be a regulatory uh, imposition? Will there be the attempt at antitrust? Or do those structures actually uh, get reinforced to grow and become singularly important uh, by the state and, and by the leadership? I, I think that's a fundamental difference. The challenge in America is regulation. Yes. What's the proper way to regulate utilities, regulate these internet? These companies are getting too big. And I, as you say, it is a discussion, it is being addressed, but we don't have exactly the answer yet. No. The security, we'll, we'll come up with it we'll by the end of the evening. <laughs> you have the security issues, you have the issue of whether individuals own the information, does the government own the information, do the companies own the information. Now you have the Chinese system where the state owns everything. Right. Okay. So regulation is not the key issue. The, reg the issue for them is, I own, I manage it. My, the problem in China, how do I get an adequate return to society from my ownership. They have not achieved that fully. And this is, when you look at the, the policy agenda for the Xi Jinping's government, I think the number one unresolved issue. Now, this gets caught up in the trade war, okay? The trade war sees these state-managed companies and sees this as part of the unfairness issue that these companies owned by the state, managed by the state, how can American companies compete with them? And my answer to this question is, that is an issue, but it's not actually the trade war issue. These state companies in China account for 10% of America's, of China's exports. They're a non-factor in this trade war, but people think actually it's the target. Remember, the bulk of the products coming from China to America, they're actually managed by American companies, right. not by Chinese companies. <laughs> So we'll stop talking about trade as the problem, and we'll really focus on some of these other fundamental d uh, internal mm -hmm. issues that uh, are true of, uh, of China. And, uh, and, you know, one of the things that I think we often have a hard time uh, understanding is the whatever domestic contradictions may exist or the inability of the state to deliver a return on the investment of mm. the Chinese people to the people. Um, and we see that whether it be in the inequalities that exist within the f uh, economics of the, of the state, and the, the inequities that exist in the populace uh, with the very rich and the very mm. poor as well, uh, undeveloped areas of the country. Uh, but these are, these are things that we often are not exposed to because it is such a large state. It is, it is so complex. Uh, it is dominantly uni-ethnic, right? It is dominantly a Han Chinese population, so there, we don't have the complexity or diversity uh, of, uh, of the United States in its populace, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we can't uh, extrapolate in any generalized way about, about the Chinese state when we look at it from the outside because of these complexities. Mm. Um, you know, at this time of the uh, of our discussion I usually turn to the audience questions and try to weave them into anything that I'm really interested in <laughs> and uh, <laughs> but, but we'll talk about uh, we, we've gotten some interesting questions some very specific you know um, we have a number of people who work in the high-tech field who are probably in the audience and one of the questions is how will China's investments in the semiconductor industry affect US China dynamics here's the problem um 
the semiconductor is industry is seen as one of America's great strengths. Yeah. And I think it's probably rightly seen by American policymakers as not just strictly an economic issue, but also as a security issue, because semiconductors are used in so many uh, in so many ways that they have both security and economic concerns. The problem, however, is that uh, America, excuse me, China is the major consumer of semiconductors. Uh, it purchases about 70, 80 percent of the semiconductors made in made in the U.S. Right. You were talking yeah, about right. Intel earlier. Yeah. It's therefore unrealistic, actually, to think that a country which buys 70 percent of something doesn't have a capacity to manufacture some of it, especially when it is the manufacturing industrial growth. So slowly what China's been trying to do is to try to get in at the lower ends. Intel is a factory in China. It's transferring knowledge to produce basic semiconductors and other things, but not the high tech. The high tech research and development of Intel's uh, best is done only in two places, here in the United States and in Israel. Otherwise, they will not do it anywhere else because of security concerns. Uh, I think the trend that will continue is that China will put a lot of effort into developing the semiconductor industries. It's going to be extremely expensive and difficult. It is becoming a big source of controversy because America in the last, we have in the last couple months, started to make, uh, put a prohibition on the export of the equipment which is used to make semiconductors. Okay? And this is a big issue because there are, there are companies in China the only equipment they use are American equipment. So they'll go out of business if they don't have access to this. Right. So the key issue of this trade war is not actually going to be this tariff rate or those kinds of things. It's going to be policies like that, controls on exports, which, if implemented, could actually wipe out major companies in China. Okay? And then from a Chinese perspective, that's a big security issue. How can I be so vulnerable to outside suppliers of something which is so integral to my economy? So I am going to wrap up investment and every means to get the knowledge to do so. And this, is, I think, is a, a huge question coming up. Well, you know, it, it relates to another question that we have here um, from the audience, which is, uh, as we look at these industries evolving and trying to protect themselves and, and making sure that they can survive within China, uh, part of what has been occurring has been uh, the acquisition of intellectual property, um, both by legal means and by illicit means. And the question from the audience is, what is your suggestion for the United States to deal with the intellectual property theft issue uh, with China? Well, I think we should first try to clarify that theft of intellectual property is illegal and should not be allowed. And I think China would agree with this. So when you talk about the criticism that China steals, the answer is if China steals, it should be penalized. You should take them to the courts. There are courts for this purpose. Now, realistically, if you talk about a lot of the cases which are small, uh, they're going to be prosecuted in courts in China. And the accusation before was the Chinese courts were not fair, or they're too slow, or if they, you won a case, you didn't get paid enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's certainly a legitimate concern. But he, here's the problem. So-called neutral strong courts were established in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen only two years ago. So you're not talking about a history of being able to deal with these kinds of cases, but you're fundamentally talking about a change in Chinese system that they're willing to deal with this. Mm -hmm. So after two, two years ago, they established in these three major cities. Last year, they broadened it to 10. So there are now about a dozen courts dealing with IPR theft issues in China, which I would say a vast improvement. Still need a lot of work. Now here's the interesting case. Um, 10 years ago, 80% of the cases would be brought by foreigners accusing Chinese of theft. Today, most of the cases are Chinese accusing Chinese of theft. That's one fundamentally important difference. The second thing I think is interesting is 90% of the cases where foreigners file a claim, they win. That wasn't the case 10 years ago. So China would say, I've got a problem. I'm trying to resolve it, but I can't solve it immediately. 
And we who operate in a legal system realize how difficult it is to revamp and change your whole court system to solve a problem. So it's not something that's neglected. It's something that has to be addressed, but it cannot be solved instantaneously. Sure. And, you know, and I think some of the industry might say, well, you know, I'm loath to go to a court because of the repercussions of actually calling out a Correct. Chinese partner and risking my distribution, my partnership, my business really within the country, so would be conservative and would have to really consider uh, seriously uh, uh, a case, taking yeah. uh, legal action. And, and, and it's not always these black and white cases either, right, where we have this case of, uh, of a outright theft. Often these areas are much grayer, where it's a intellectual property acquisition or the handing over through partnership of intellectual property that's being used by an industry. I, can, uh, I recently read about a, a particular case where um, Chinese investors had come to the United States and were looking at uh, early stage technology companies uh, putting in deposit, looking for a in, uh, serious investment making sure that during the due diligence they were exposed to everything that they would like to uh, see to make sure that the technology was going to be of interest to them, demanding a fair amount of, uh, uh, of transparency from the company that they were about to acquire. And then at the end, were unable to make the investment, All right. calling uh, force majeure, saying that the Chinese state won't let me uh, export the money. And by the way, because of force majeure, because I'm not allowed to export the money and to invest in this company, I actually I want my deposit back as well. Okay. And so, uh, so there are these. There's a spectrum of how one can actually acquire intellectual property that isn't necessarily going in at night, breaking into somebody's file box, and then stealing the chip. And I think that is the issue. It's not the theft. It's these other aspects. Yeah. But think about it. Here we live in San Francisco. You go down to Silicon Valley. What is Silicon Valley? It's bunch an of office buildings. It's an industry <laughs> yes. which is built on transfer of technology. Yeah. Startups build up and establish a new technology. What happens next? It's sold to somebody. That's a transfer. That's considered good. Or they have a joint venture arrangement. Joint ventures force transfer of technology is the key to this state. It's the key to America's growth. So there's nothing wrong with this. Now let's take a go a step further. Is there force transfer of technology in America? I'm not talking about this voluntary mm -hmm. collaboration. The answer is yes, a hostile takeover. We have companies that take over another company by buying them all out and that company doesn't want to sell, but they eventually have to or something happens. Hostile takeovers are also part of the competitive scene in America. So whether it's a voluntary joint venture or a hostile, transfers occur and that's why America grows. And we accept that as good for innovation, right? Oh, it's great it's if it's great within it. one nation. But within one nation. By, but Across <laughs> nations makes yes. it more difficult, Much right? more difficult. Okay. And, and strategically much more threatening. So in my book, I talk about America. Who was the first great innovator in America? Um, Francis uh, Cabot Lowell, Harvard graduate, 100 years ago. He established the Industrial Revolution in America, right? Mm -hmm. How did he do it? He went to England. When he got to England, what did he find? He realized that England was wealthy because it had the power loom. Mm -hmm. Made it wealthier than France, Germany, everything else. Only England had it. If you worked in the power loom sector in England, you were not allowed to travel for fear of losing <laughs> the secret to the power loom. So what did Francis Cavallo do? He spent six months, and he's brilliant. He went around there, he memorized it. He put it in his head. He came back to Lowell, Massachusetts, reproduced the entire factory launched the Industrial Revolution. So if you Google Francis Cabot Lowell in the Wiki, WikiLeaks, Wiki, Wikipedia, not WikiLeaks, <laughs> <laughs> he will be called America's first great innovator. Right. He's also America's first great IPR thief. Yes. Okay. <laughs> and then history shows that everybody steals. Now here's the problem. If you're poor, you steal from countries which are richer. If you're the richest, you don't find anybody to steal from because you have all the things. So Intel doesn't steal. Infield creates because it's at the, f the top. Now, this is the problem I think that's a really tricky issue. Should we encourage the transfer of technology or IPR knowledge from rich countries to poor countries? That's the question. Because poor, rich countries develop it. They have to develop it. They already have it. They're not going to get it from a poor country. They're way advanced. So they develop it. Poor countries don't. They don't spend enough in R&D, they're not capable of it, they tend to get it, legally or illegally, right? Yeah. 
So this question of unfairness depends upon whether we think this is good or bad, that rich countries transfer technology to poor countries. Should we discourage it, control it, restrict it? And the question is, is there actually, is there an internationally recognized principle guiding this? Because fairness requires some kind of a norm, right? So Google WTO, every member of WTO has signed on to a statement. And surprisingly enough, there's a statement about technology transfer. Surprisingly, not unsurprisingly, practically no one's ever read it. What this statement says, it says rich countries are obligated to provide every incentive to transfer technology to poor countries. Obligated. <laughs> now we accuse China for unfairness because they do it so well. <laughs> okay? But here's then the problem. Is China a poor country? Is China a developed country? So actually the debate about unfairness is really not about unfairness. That's right. It's about whether China is a developing country or developed. China claims it's developing. Its income is one-sixth that of America. America claims that China is not a developing country. They would claim China, America, excuse me, they would claim that China is a developed country. So when you go, when Americans, when Ch uh, Chinese and American negotiators get together, the American negotiators say to the Chinese, I see a very rich country with some poor people. And the Chinese will say, we're actually a very poor country with a lot of, with a fair number of rich people. <laughs> okay, and that's the debate. Because if China was not a developing country, it no longer sort of like benefits from this kind of philosophy mm -hmm. that you want to encourage to transfer technology to them. Right. Well, and of course, the complexity of all of this is that, you know, back in Lowell's day, you could you required six months away. Uh, now it's really just two clicks away, right? I mean, it really is just a matter of seconds rather than months. And and dissipates that whatever competitive advantage may have existed during that right. technology transfer I mean which allowed for the new technologies to be evolved and the like but the, but your question is really relevant and it's key and it's something that was brought up by a number of the questioners here as well is China a developing country or a developed country uh, you know those of us who live in California know that a fifth of our populace lives under the poverty line it is in fact also uh, in many ways facing some of the very same mm. issues that are faced by China. And so, uh, not to the same degree, of course. And the answer, I think, when you ask this question, is China developing or a developed country, the answer is both. Because it is, in fact, both of those things. Um, mm. You uh, brought up WTO, and, uh, and one of our uh, questioners here says, even a stop clock is right twice a day. This is from John Navis. Isn't Trump right that the WTO is badly in need of reform? And, um, uh, you know, along those lines, since we're going to talk about WTO, maybe we'll talk... Uh, We'll talk about TPP mm. next because, but, but let's talk about WTO. It's rare I get to sit with a banker who actually understands this stuff. Mm. So why don't you tell us if, uh, if WTO is broken and needs reform? WTO is like one of those institutions where you say it's, it's terrible, it's out of date, but we have nothing better. Uh -huh. So you have to work with it. But working with it is difficult. To change something, you have to get everyone to agree. So how do you get everyone to agree in this world? Very, very difficult. Uh, in terms of the U.S.-China trade war dispute, mm -hmm. uh, WTO is not useful because the problems we, we've just been discussing are not covered in WTO. Right. The concept of unfairness, just as I said, the WTO actually says in there, yes. you should encourage the transfer. Right. But the issue is then, is China developing a developed country? Now here's the issue. WTO basically, when China joined, China joined under a so-called asterisk. It was actually recognized as not exactly developing, not exactly developed. Mm -hmm. And that is what it is. It is not really a developed, it's not really a developing country. But what is China that really makes it different is actually it's just so darn big. If it were split up into 20, it'd be like a South Korea or something. It wouldn't be an issue. Singapore. Singapore generates a huge trade surplus every single year forever. No one cares, it's so small. So it's big, and the second thing is, it state is so dominant. Now, 
there's no other country like this. State dominated and so big, it's not actually a WTO issue in some sense. Because I don't think I need to change the whole WTO. And if I do, it doesn't really affect these other countries too much. Right. It's really a China issue. So WTO is one route, but cumbersome. Right. Okay. So as you begin in the beginning is, how do you address these issues? And I think we've talked about the issues a little bit more. Yes. The answer is, there are ways actually to address this issue. Mm -hmm. And it's not through a tariff. Uh, we were actually discussing these issues with China through a bilateral investment treaty. Because, as I said earlier, the issue is actually about investment. Yeah. Okay? Why is it you don't see a single headline or anything that talks about a bilateral investment treaty? The answer is because it was an Obama-era initiative. Mm -hmm. And President Trump doesn't want to touch anything that has anything to do with Obama. But that treaty specifically talked exactly about these issues. Mm -hmm. And the question would be, China wasn't moving fast enough, would they move more rapidly? And I think the answer would be, they need to move more rapidly. And what is the pressure that you could actually do? Here's some of the things you could actually do. You could insist upon equal treatment in certain areas, okay? That if you're going to restrict this kind of stuff, I will restrict your activity over here. And let's talk about what that means. That's what you could do. That's not a tariff. That's basically talking about the issue that's at hand. Yeah. Okay? You're talking about joint ventures. You have joint ventures, which encourages a foreign firm to work with a Chinese firm, and it creates unnecessary pressures for technology to be transferred. And that's unfair. Okay? So why not just say abolish that need for a required joint venture deal? So you can choose whether you want to. Now, what would happen? Most American companies would say, I want a joint venture. Take General Motors. General Motors earns most of its profit in China. Right. It has a joint venture, okay? Would General Motors give up that joint venture? Not at all. Because it needs a distribution outlet and everything else. It can't afford to establish it. So here's the point. 10 years ago, 90% of Americans investment going into China went through a joint venture. Today, only 20%. It's not very significant anymore. Now, 10% probably is the bare minimum because if you are in a security area or some area where it's nationally important, it's reasonable for a country to say, I want you to work with a local counterpart. But there's a 10% of what I call required joint venture, which I say, it's just not worth it anymore. So I, my recommendation to the Chinese government is, just don't have this requirement. Okay? And then when people accuse you of, of uh, forced transfer, you can easily say, I'm not forcing anybody. They don't have to form a joint venture at all. Okay? So how can you accuse me of it? And I just think of the political cost in America of perceiving China as being unfair just isn't worth the hassle of having this requirement for a joint venture. Well, it's, it, it, these are all very good points, and I think w uh, in your litany of, of things that concern uh, those in the West and in the United States in particular, when we look at how investment is being made and how, uh, operate, how the state operates, is the concern that some of the societal and political norms that mm. are uh, established in China that are being projected upon industries that are operating within that country are now being globalized, right? And these include whether or not uh, certain websites or newspapers or others must take a, a perspective that is a dominantly Beijing-oriented perspective. And I'll use the example of uh, one of the major hotel chains that recently right. solved its uh, labor <laughs> problems but didn't solve its China problem when it recognized uh, or identified Taiwan as being a separate entity than the People's Republic of China. So the idea that, in fact, Chinese norms and Chinese mm. perspectives can be imposed upon institutions that are uh, I that are American or German or, or others, and so I think there's a great fear, mm. uh, and and, I, and it seems a quite justified fear that there is uh, this forced uh, uh, movement towards an acceptance of of Beijing norms. My, my view about this is is an overblown worry. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, I was born in China, but I came over to America when I was five, so I've lived in Washington for half a century. And and my 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 point about the the Chinese norms and Chi and American norms, I've lived in both countries now for long periods of time, and I and I say to myself, here in America, 
I think we're far too sophisticated and knowledgeable to be influenced by some of these Chinese practices which people think are ideologically, you know, going to shift us. I don't think they're actually trying very hard either, actually. They're more likely to be successful in trying to establish culinary institutes than Confucius institutes. I don't think anyone's going to be, be, be uh, uh, persuaded by some of what I call the ideological messages that come out of there. China's basic position is, I'm not here to change your political system. And, and here in America, there are people who don't accept that. They think they are. But I don't think they are. Their basic view is, there are different systems, and none of them are very perfect, but we each have our own. What I do want is recognition that we can collaborate and get along in a world where there are different systems. So I don't want to actually force mine on yours, nor do I want you to force yours on mine. Now, I think that this is getting tougher. Why is this particular view getting tougher now? Why is it generating more tension than it was 10 or 15 years ago? Part of it is, I think, the South China Sea the disputes where China's assertiveness gives a sense that they want to do something more and that something more may constrain America's foreign policies. It's the one belt, one road, where China's trying to build these bridges all through Central Asia to Europe. And the issue here being, do these initiatives have longer political strategic interests which threaten America's way of life or thinking? And I think sitting here in Washington, I can understand this very easily. Uh, when I go to China, I look around, and I say, my gosh, I don't think anyone there is even thinking about this or cares. Okay? It's, it isn't in the minds of anybody, okay? I think, that, therefore, it's an exaggerated but a legitimate concern. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, how do you deal with this? And here's where I think it comes up in the trade war. Because the third war leg of the trade war in terms of how you respond to it is this issue of should America start to disengage from China, you know? separate our economies, our relationships, because of this concern that you mentioned, mm -hmm. that they're trying to spread this. And I would say that is really just illogical. Yeah. Okay. And in, in fact, there is a report that just came out uh, recently. Uh, it was released in Washington, D.C. It was uh, co-sponsored by my host organization, mm -hmm. the Hoover Institution. And in fact, I was a part of the working group and task force, which does not call for a break from engagement, but rather calls for what is uh, referred to as constructive vigilance, which is an understanding uh, that there needs to be more transparency, greater integrity, and reciprocity. Those are the three main points that are sought in this new uh, approach towards the relationship with China. And yet again, we're not talking about trade wars in, within this because right. it really is about these fundamental issues that, we're, that, that the United States is looking for. Let me go back to one more question here from our audience, and this is one where I'm going to ask you to look into your crystal ball. Fast forward 20 to 30 years, what is the U.S.-China relationship going to look like? Mm -hmm. And does somebody win? <laughs> because that's what the president likes to talk about, is winning. <laughs> you know, I'm not a foreign policy expert or international relations. I'm an economist. And so I look at all these issues from an economic perspective, and then I try to get a foreign policy bent. I, I think it's something to me which is interesting. Right now, we have this tremendous amount of tensions. Is it coincidental? Why did it occur now? So I have a graph in my book which traces the share of global production of America, Europe, and China. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it, China always talks about long term, right? So 200 years ago, China accounted for 35% of global production, huge. By 1980, that 35% fell to 3%. The sharpest decline we've ever seen, but over 200 years. So 1980, China accounts for 3% of the global production. America and Europe, by the way, are accounting for about 20, 25% each. 1980. So China starts to grow very rapidly. Today, its share is 17% of global production. It's exactly the same as America and Europe. Hmm. This year, okay? So these three entities have exactly the same share of global production today. Now, graph trade, exports and imports, is a share of, of the total. By coincidence, Europe, US, China, exactly the same <laughs> today, okay? So no wonder we're experiencing this sense of tension 
economic, rising power, threatening America. It's real. It's an issue. So then your question is fast forward. What will it be like in 2030? Okay. So here's China growing at 6.5%. But let's assume it's not going to grow at 65 That's too high. So assume China grows at 4 for the next 12, 15 years. Okay. America and Europe grows at 25 which is a solid rate. China's share of global production will be 25%. America's and Europe's will fall down to about 12. So it will be twice as large in purchasing power terms. So that's the alarming thing of the people who are interested in global politics. Gosh, China's going to be here. We're going to be here. It's going to be a problem. But here's the problem. The size of the economy does not determine your political or strategic power. It's actually your per capita GDP. That's the quality of your institutions, your soft power, your military strength. It's not the overall size. It's how deep and sophisticated you are as a country, okay? Here's something people don't realize. A China which grows at twice the rate of America, China's per capita GDP gap with America continues to get wider. Hmm. It doesn't narrow. An America that grows at 2.5% a year, which is solid, in my view, will perpetuate its global economic dominance, its security, its military, its soft power for the foreseeable future. So for America, living here in America, the key issue in America is to make sure that we continue to grow at a reasonable rate, that we spend it properly, that we continue to innovate and build our, our tent. We don't have to worry about a rising China in what I call a true power sense. And that's why I think this war is inevitable but unnecessary. Okay, And the threat, if you make it a threat, it's sort of like far-fetched threat. And those who are my military colleagues realize that there is no way that China in a military sense can be competitive in foreseeable future. But the quality of the institutions, the soft power, the innovation, those kinds of ideas, you're talking about a gap that spans more maybe 50, 60, 70 years, not a five-year issue. But here we are. We're all intersecting today. Very logical that people feel the pressures. Crystal ball ahead and then ask, what do we do about it? Okay, and I think that is a legitimate debate. Dr. Yukon Huang, thank you so much. Welcome. It's been really fascinating. You've contextualized. <laughs>